cautionary uh, tale right there. <laughs> but <yes>. anyway. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to Do What You Can for the People, the show that nobody asked for. I'm your hostess, Nicole Pomani, and I'm here today with Katie Cassidy. Katie is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, an advocate of sustainable eating, and the chief content producer of Radically Sustainable, a website dedicated to discussing the infrastructures involved in sustainable food production. Hi Katie, thanks so much for being on the show today. Hi, Nicole. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to have you on the show today. We're going to get into a lot of things around sustainable food. And for all of you watching, you know that the theme of this season is the holidays. And that's really why I wanted to have Katie on the show today to kind of talk about a more sustainable Thanksgiving meal, really focusing on ingredients and how to utilize ingredients in the most responsible way possible, if you will. So when I was kind of putting this together, I was thinking about what eating more sustainably on Thanksgiving means to me. And for me, it kind of falls into two buckets, eating more locally sourced and seasonal foods and reducing waste. So as usual, we're gonna kind of frame the problem for you guys and talk about why eating more locally sourced or seasonal foods is important. Um, and Katie, feel free to chime in at any point here. But for me, I think we've all become very used to going to the grocery store and finding like any imaginable food item. And in a lot of cases, I don't think we realize that what we're buying, the food that we're consuming has been grown more than a thousand miles away. Um, if you walk out onto the street, you're not gonna see a banana tree here in New Jersey or New York. And I think that that's something that a lot of people don't remember that um, food has to be grown somewhere and then it has to be transported. And, there's this thing called food miles, which is the total geographic distance. Um, your food is transported between its cultivation, its processing, all of those things until it reaches your plate. I'm gonna pause there, Katie, if you have anything to add. Yeah, um, that's so right on. A ton of people don't realize um, that maybe like the picture on, um, on the label of a turkey for Thanksgiving, like it's, it looks happy, like it looks like um, it might even be organic or claim to be organic. And so many people don't understand that even on organic production or even if um, they market it like it's a family raised turkey or um, vegetable product, it typically is not. It's grown in an organic CAFO. Um, and CAFOs are basically um, industrialized butchering centers where millions of animals a year um, are, are obviously butchered, but in a, a very neglectful and um, unrespectful way. And that's where over 90% of America's meat comes from. It's it's where I think like close to 80% of the world's meat comes from. And um, those are not only thousands of miles away, but they come from factories and places that guzzle gas and release toxic fumes into our water sources. So there's so many different um, avenues to look at when you look at just one food product like a turkey. And it could, I mean, turkey's one example. There's pick any food item and the food miles attached to it and uh, the environmental, social, and economic impact are immeasurable. So complicated. <laughs> so complicated. I know that last season I did a couple episodes related to kind of our food systems as well. I did one on industrial farming and one on veganism and kind of like the impact of factory farming um, in terms of the vegan world. Um, but what really kind of caught my attention in this space is eating locally is something that I think a lot of people hear about, but they don't really understand why it's important or, you know, eating what's in season. Um, on top of the food miles, I think it's important to remember that when you're transporting food and when you're trying to push it across the planet, a lot of it is picked, a lot of produce is picked while it's still unripe. And then it's there are chemicals added to kind of ripen it in transit, or it, there are a lot of preservatives added. Um, 
there's a lot that goes into keeping your food stable for transportation and sale that I think a lot of people forget about. Um, I found a fact that scientists are currently experimenting with genetic modification to make your produce longer lasting and less perishable, which kind of seems counterintuitive because anyone who's bought produce knows that it is going to continue to ripen and maybe even go bad over time. There's so much I could go into here. Um, right now, there's actually a big push for um, seed libraries to preserve um, original hereditary seeds and heirloom seeds um, because they're the species, the natural original species from the Holocene, for example, um, they're going extinct because industrial America, when we entered into the new, new epoch of the Anthropocene in like the 1940s, um, along came the GMOs that um, produced so many different types of unedible corn that has to be mashed for CAFO use, um, which is 80% of where our corn goes in America. And um, soybeans, so many different GMO types of soybeans. Apples are being modified. Um, the russet potato that everybody thinks is such a classic thing, it's such an American thing. Um, that, that got invented less than 200 years ago. It's, it's, not, um, it's not original, it's not sustainable, it's, it's an industrialized product that was hardy and um, was brought to America so we could have um, a lot of something, but it, it's a sick something. Because in essence, when you take a seed and you modify it to the point of, um, to the point of like, it's really good at mass producing, but it has no protective properties. So you keep making it more and more sick um, and then it doesn't have any resistance to uh, insects or weather. So then we have to dump pesticides, herbicides, and other things on it to protect it. Um, and that's kind of been a cyclical thing with a ton of different seeds. So uh, seed preservation, I think that ties in, what you were saying ties in a lot to seed preservation um, and eating heirloom products. Yeah, and I, I want to get back to the heirlooms because that was something that you put in our notes that I am really curious about. But uh, I think what we're really trying to say is that the systems that we currently live in are prioritizing quantity over quality. And that's yeah. just kind of a nature of living in a country that has an exponentially growing population, lots more mouths to feed, um, and all of the agriculture kind of being pushed out to the rural parts of our country and having those parts of the country try to support everything and it's it's really difficult I think to kind of even begin to think about how to solve that problem so I'm really glad that someone like you is thinking about it and working towards it. Yeah there's definitely a lot going on in that realm. Um, there's a lot of industrial agriculture right now but scientists and now farmers are starting to see that uh, they won't be able to last this way through the next century. So um, there's been a push for regenerative agriculture cultivation because um, agriculture, in essence, actually isn't a sustainable practice. You can't make agriculture sustainable um, because industrialization is tied to it. So um, the concept is to plant kind of restorative foods or heirloom seeds, different things um, that restore the soil and work with the ecosystems, the natural ecosystems, to start um, naturally feeding the population. Because right now we're living off of so many um, processed goods or uh, imported foods, like we were talking about with the food miles, um, that won't sustain us through maybe even the next 70 years, especially with water usage tying into it and so many other factors. Um, so we're starting to see transitions, which is really exciting. Um, even the government is starting to enact policies to protect our soils and our waterways. Um, especially with the current switch in administration, we're hoping to see a lot of, a lot more changes. <laughs> Absolutely. And I do know also that there were a couple of interesting documentaries that came out, I think, fairly recently about regenerative agriculture. So I will try and find those names and put them down in the description box for everyone to check out if you're interested in this. 
Um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about some of the ideas and inspiration for more sustainable eating, especially around Thanksgiving that you've kind of listed here. So the first one is introducing more sustainable options. Why don't you walk us through some of these? More sustainable options. Um, I think when thinking about sustainable options for, especially for holidays, when you're gathering with a lot of people who have the expectation of getting normal stuffing and the potatoes and fun appetizers for the football game, um, it can be really, really hard to cater a sustainable meal to a wide range of people. Um, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm from the place where industrial agriculture happens and everyone if I served someone like cauliflower mash, they would look at me and be like, okay, you can, you can go eat that in your room. <laughs> uh, so to kind of break that, that regularity of these unsustainable products, um, I, I had to introduce it to my family and to um, people I work with pretty slowly. Um, and I had to do a lot of testing and, uh, a food waste kitchen, actually. Um, I'm part of Menus of Change, the collaborative, and we work with Stanford Department of Health and Harvard University on revitalizing food systems and um, and sustainable meals. So that's kind of where I got to do a lot of my testing. And we found that, especially with holiday meals, um, substitutions are, are great, but what people really, um, what what makes them really eat the food is the flavor right. and um, the nostalgia attached to the food items. So um, I guess we'll go back to mashed potatoes. Say we wanted to make mashed potatoes for a group of people um, and they didn't want mashed cauliflower. They wanted the potato, the russet potato. Um, a good way to start integrating um, sustainable eating into your household is maybe mixing it half and half. So get local cauliflower, from um, a farmer's market, or um, if you're part of a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture, uh, sometimes they'll have that this time of year. So by mixing half and half, they'll still get the potato that they really want, and they'll taste that more than they will the cauliflower. It'll come in as a background note, but you've made the meal more um, sustainable automatically. So uh, that's kind of one method you could go about um, turning classic kind of food of Thanksgiving into a more sustainable option. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, I don't know how many you want me to go into. No, right I think now. that's that's a great example. And I think um, it's a little bit better than kind of trying to pull a fast one on your family by serving mashed cauliflower and then pretending like they're crazy when they're like, this doesn't taste like mashed potatoes. So <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of kind of doing a half and half and adding more depth also to your dishes by having a variety of ingredients. Um, so that's really cool. And I noticed here also you put a note in our little agenda about less salt, more herbs. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? What makes, is salt unsustainable? I would consider it socially unsustainable. So yeah. there's three pillars of sustainability, economics, um, social impact, and then environmental. And um, social, under the branch of social sustainability, health's involved, obviously, human health. And um, a lot, there's been an overconsumption of salt that's been gradually increasing over um, the past hundred, maybe, yeah, about a hundred years. And um, I know in the culinary, at the Culinary Institute and other institutions working on um, more healthful products and social sustainability and decreasing medical expenses for people through food. Um, salt's been a big factor in making people sick because um, it requires them to drink more water, but they won't necessarily drink that. Um, and then their body will get out of whack or salt because it's such a powerful mineral. Um, it'll affect how your food's absorbed how often you have to use the restroom, how um, your brain functions, your energy levels, it, it just affects so many different things. Um, so instead of using such a powerful mineral in such huge quantities, um, 
because between salt and sugar, Americans, uh, our consumption's off the charts, crazy. Um, we're finding that substituting with herbs has been a really um, impactful and well-received method to seasoning. So um, using herbs in your mashed potatoes, like rosemary, thyme, garlic, um, it's going to add a lot of flavor into it, um, an emphasis on the potatoes, but you might only have to add like a teaspoon of salt. You won't have to add um, a fourth of a cup of salt. Like, it's crazy what some people use in their food. Um, and just by substituting like a teaspoon of rosemary, um, a teaspoon of thyme, and um, like a few cloves of garlic, it adds that umami and that background and it adds to the mouthfeel that you have and um, gives you like more than nostalgia. It makes your brain pop um, and makes new memories. So that's been really impactful. Awesome, yeah. I love to cook um, and I love using herbs, especially this time of year because I feel like fall food isn't fall food without herbs. Um, I made a big batch of chicken noodle soup the other day and I put in a bunch of thyme and rosemary and I actually forgot the salt in my recipe and I didn't even notice. So I think one key takeaway for a lot of people could be is like, yeah, use less salt. And the way that I cook is always, I prefer to undersalt my food because you can always add a little bit more later when you're eating it, but you can't take it away once you've put it in there. Exactly. And I think also, um, umami, so salt falls under the flavor characteristic of umami and, um, which is MSG essentially. So when you substitute that out for other umami rich foods, um, you typically don't notice. So if you add a bunch of like savory herbs and garlic and maybe like chicken stock, like in your soup, you're not going to tell the difference. It's, yeah. it's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about heirloom varieties. Can you explain to us what an heirloom is, how it's different from other varieties, and kind of why it's more desirable. So I think there's many different definitions going around about heirloom varieties. Um, how I like to think about it, the simplest way to think about it, is using um, old seeds, like original OG seeds. Um, and staying away from seeds that have been modified in a lab or have been um, crossed with other breeds. Because, I mean, GMOs are as old as, oh my gosh, as old as the country. Like, Native Americans would cross corn, for example, to make the kernels bigger so that they could feed more, more people off of one cop. Um, so I think... I think GMOs have, or not GMOs, heirloom varieties have a tricky connotation because you can still have a GMO in an heirloom variety, but you can't have an heirloom variety be a GMO. It's not the same thing. Interesting. Does that make sense? I think so. Maybe say it one more time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, kind of what I said about the Native Americans um, crossing the seeds, like that was a GMO um, product, but they were using original seed varieties mm. um, that came from the United States hundreds of years ago. Uh, but nowadays, people aren't incorporating the heirloom varieties at all in um, crop production because they've been modified so many times, the original genes are actually gone and then they're still crossing them and forming GMOs. So the new variety of seeds, um, the new normal, is um, creating a resistant seed that can withstand chemicals. That's the primary goal of any um, industrial farmer, is to create a GMO seed that can last through a lot of different, through a lot of different conditions and then a lot of different pesticides um, but it's still consumable by an, by an animal. Like that's, it's not even to feed us anymore. Um, we get the byproducts. So 
Uh, it's kind of crazy how things went from beautiful heirloom seeds to nourish us, um, and in turn we would nourish our animals to no, we're gonna um, fatten the animals first, and then you guys can eat the animals that are eating things that they shouldn't be eating. And then, um, yeah, it, it's crazy how seeds have changed so much in the past like 400 years. Yeah, I mean, but, that's, a, um, that's a very, pardon my French, but a very fucked up system to have created for ourselves. Um, so I'm glad that you're bringing, you know, the information to the people because quite honestly, I didn't know about this until today. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, and I'm sorry, what, what was the second part of the question? The second part of the question was why are heirlooms more desirable? But I think we've kind of hit the nail on the head with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So maybe let's move away from some of the sadder parts of this and kind of talk about some of your best tips of how to eat more sustainably, how to plan more sustainably for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Um, Thanksgiving's one of my favorite holidays because of um, the fresh fall vegetables and the apple picking seasons and um, all the things you can do with it. The vegetables are really hearty. So um, you're kind of limitless uh, with what you want, what you can do with them. They can be manipulated in so many different ways in the kitchen. So um, I took on kind of a kind of one of the biggest challenges I think I have for a while, and I chose to eat um, nothing that was over a hundred miles away from me. Oh. So um, I became a locavore, for lack of better words. Um, and by being a locavore, I had to play with a lot of um, seasonal foods because that's all I had access to. And so I think during the fall, the primary um, substance that I would eat would be squash because it's the most filling. And then you could supplement with the seeds from the squash as an added fat and protein. So then you have your complex carbohydrate, you have your, car- um, your fat, and then your protein um, if utilized in the same dish. And then I would get my micros from the fall greens and from an apple and um, and any like any a lot of poultry a lot of poultry I don't know why in my opinion it take it tastes better in the fall I don't know if that's because um I I only eat free range chickens so um when they're going through in the fall maybe it's more tender um or the stuff they're eating is more tender the insects are more active but um yeah there's there's a lot you can do um from region to region uh I know that you've prepared a bit of a menu. Do you want to highlight maybe a dish or two for the people to think about from that menu that you've created? Yeah, I can definitely do that. So for the appetizers, my favorite Thanksgiving appetizer is probably um, my cauliflower and parsnip crusted pizza. Um, I did this because when I started my locavore journey, um, I couldn't find any flour that was milled less than a hundred miles away. So I had to kind of um, manipulate things to make, um, make baked goods. And a lot of the bulk of it was um, cauliflower parsnips and then um, potatoes or sweet potatoes because it's starch heavy and um, it's easier to substitute in a grain-based dish than a lot of people think. Um, So for the pizza, it's a half and half mix of cauliflower and parsnips. And you grate the parsnips on a cheese grater. um, And then the cauliflower, you pulse in a blender and you add that in with eggs and a little bit. I I used oats because I didn't have a better option, but um, I've been told it's really good with coconut flour. And then a little bit of Parmesan cheese and kind of as a stabilizer and an egg for stabilizer. And when you mix that up, it makes a really nice crust. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Yeah, it's kind of fun. And um, the cheese really adds like an acidity and kind of a saltiness to it because it has a little bit more umami. So you don't even have to add any salt, which is nice. Um, And then you press it down into a baking sheet. 
and just par bake it for 10 minutes. And then after that, you can put on whatever toppings you want. My favorite's probably um, beets and goat cheese and arugula with a little bit of um, star balsamic from the balsamic store nearby. Uh, I know that's not really an option for a lot of people. I got really lucky. Um, but honey can be really good on it. Like if you uh, mix honey and paprika and then put it on with beets and goat cheese and like a spicy green and maybe black pepper, mm -hmm. um, it can be really tasty. Uh, or butternut squash. There's so many opportunities. Like you really just need the crust and then just yeah, have fun. Go crazy with the toppings. Pick the toppings that fit you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's probably my favorite appetizer. Um, my favorite entree is butternut squash. So far like that I've made. Um, the butternut squash is just it can be kind of tricky because the, the butternut squash acts as your pasta. So instead of eating, again, like the refined carbohydrates that you always find in the store, um, you're using a, like another complex carbohydrate that kind of um, works slower in your digestive tract, but um, still provides a lot of energy. And so usually what I do, I'll cut it in in half so I'll just use the neck as the layers for um the pasta and then I'll incorporate the base in kind of the innards mm. um so you take a mandolin which is um I don't know how to describe it but it's, it's a cutting utensil it's a device that cuts like super thin <laughs> strips of things is kind of like the best way but be careful with them yeah. I've known them to take fingers off yeah I actually just took my nail off the other day because <laughs> <laughs> Cautionary uh, tale right there. <laughs> but yes. anyways. Anyways. Um, so you want to make sure the settings at about half an inch thick, and then you just um shave it into layers. And then when you have all of your layers, um, what I like to do is take a little bit of salt and then black pepper, paprika, and herbs. Um and you just kind of lightly sprinkle it on top with some olive oil and just like let that sit for a little bit so the moisture is absorbed by the salt and then all the herbs go in it's kind of a unique process but um yeah you let that sit for about 10 minutes um and then for the innards you just take the butternut squash that um the base of it and you roast it in the oven. And then when that's done, you mix it with ricotta, rosemary, thyme, garlic, um, oil, uh, and a few other things. And it's just this really savory, yummy filling. Um, I like to add spinach to it too for a, a fresh component. Um, and then you just blend it. And when it's all done, then you start layering. So it goes butternut squash, the filling, and lasagna. just repeat that yeah it's it's lasagna That's and awesome. it's great yeah you utilize the whole vegetable it's, it's so fun that's awesome definitely gonna have to try that I've made a butternut squash lasagna before but I used pasta noodles and so now this has inspired me to eliminate <laughs> the pasta noodles and make it this way and if anyone who's watching makes one of these please tag me on Instagram and I want to see your incredible creations definitely it's it's so much fun and a lot of people don't um don't think about lasagna without without the noodles and the first time i made it for my family my midwest family um they're just they were so confused <laughs> um but they tried it and they they couldn't tell they they liked it um so i always take that as like it's always a very good thing when my family tells me like something sustainable is it's good because yeah. that means like maybe maybe there's some hope for the dish yeah absolutely yeah um, and I think one of the things that I love about cooking and eating more sustainable more sustainably and this is I think something that you share a passion for is the creativity involved 
where it becomes less of like a mundane task of having to feed yourself and it becomes more like an adventure almost, especially if you like to cook and you love to cook and I love to cook. Um, If you enjoy that, then I think it just opens up so many more possibilities for creativity. Yeah, exactly. And the possibilities are endless with so many, um, so many recipes like this because everyone's flavor profiles, like profiles different. So Um, If you don't like a particular spice, you can switch it out. If you can't eat cheese, um, you can use a non-dairy substitute or just use the butternut squash and um, just the spinach because it's it's sticky enough, for lack of a better term, to kind of like put in. Um, Yeah, there's just so much you can do with so many different ingredients and so many of these recipes. Absolutely. And I I hope that everyone kind of, if there's one takeaway from this video is that you don't have to maybe switch and go like all local, all seasonal food, but there are ways to start incorporating more sustainable solutions without losing the deliciousness of the holiday or the fun of all the cooking or, you know, just the, the creativity that goes into building these elaborate menus, that there are ways to kind of do both and you don't have to be at either end of the spectrum you should find your happy medium Mm -hmm. yeah even like adding two more locally sourced products is such a big feat for so many people that's i mean if 100 people did that that's 200 products that were both bought in their local economies or local communities that are supporting their local economies um which helps with economic growth and then um sustainable growth because it proves to local governments that it's a worthwhile endeavor to have a farmer's market or to have a local farm store available. Absolutely. So I think you've shared some really good recipes with us for thinking more about locally sourced and seasonal foods, but I did want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what I think is the other component here, reducing waste. Um, And so as someone who's a Uh, involved with the circular economy and has kind of dedicated her life to waste reduction. This is something that I'm super interested in and there are lots of episodes that I've done on this. We won't spend too much time here, but I think in the context of Thanksgiving, there are a couple of tips that I would like to share with the people. And if you have any thoughts, feel free to chime in on these. Um, The first one is careful planning and purchasing. So I actually started my Thanksgiving menu planning a couple days ago. Um, and I know how many people we're going to have and uh, how many dishes I want to make and what I'm going to need from the grocery store. And I think a lot of people do that, but maybe a second part to that is thinking about how you're going to utilize your leftovers. Um, Last week's episode was actually all about composting and how we underutilize leftovers in this country. And um, I know that Katie has some suggestions for how to use your leftovers, but I'll quickly share mine, which is every year I make a Thanksgiving casserole and I make a Thanksgiving soup with my leftovers. And I think it's just a great way to make sure that I can have all the sides that I want at Thanksgiving, but I'm not throwing that food away the next day or the day after that. Um, You wrote here cauliflower mash into fritters. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We always, at my family's Thanksgiving, we always have leftover mashed potatoes, um, no matter how hard we try to eat all of them. And um, something I started doing, because I'm not a fan of leftover mashed potatoes. I don't know why, but it's just, it's not the same as day of mashed potatoes. (laughs) So um, I started getting playful one night, and I took the mashed potatoes, and I added um, some ground oats and an egg and a lot of spices um, and started frying them off in a frying pan with some sunflower oil. And I made a bunch and then I made a butternut um, squash dipping sauce from leftover squash that we, I I forget what it was. I think it was squash with marshmallows on it. (laughs) I just took the marshmallows off and used the squash. <laughs> yeah. But um I made a dipping sauce out of it. I thinned it out with um some apple cider vinegar and um a little oil and um added spices to that too because condiments are the best. Um 
and the whole plate was gone in a few minutes. It's really just um, about looking, looking into your fridge, taking an inventory of what leftovers you have, and then um, Pinterest is a really good, <laughs> good spot to go for what to do with leftovers. Uh, I think a few of my ideas have been based off of recipes from there, um, but just kind of really not, um, it's good to keep your mind open about what you have in your fridge and what the possibilities are. Like, no one looks at mashed potatoes and says, this is going to be an awesome fritter, or like looking at, um, uh turkey offals and being like you know i'm gonna make a stock with those today like a lot of people look at bones and might say that but the offals have flavor too mm -hmm. so it's really good to um before throwing anything away stopping looking at it and being like this is edible what can i do with it like i see that a lot with broccoli stems and carrot um carrot peels and stuff too that it's all stuff that can be utilized before going into compost. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I love to make my own vegetable stock with scraps. And then, like I said, every year I make Thanksgiving soup. And I've always, for the past few years, I've tried to save it because I love to have like frozen soup in my freezer. And inevitably, a few people will kind of crawl out of the woodwork the week after Thanksgiving, like, hey, you, you got any of that Thanksgiving soup? And it's like, gone before I even know what to do with it. So um, I love I, it. I'll type up the recipe and put it down in the description box in case anyone is looking for some inspiration. It's a recipe, meaning I kind of just like throw whatever I have into the pot and then add a few things. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a good one, I think. And of course, I'll include links to everything that Katie mentioned in case you want to check out some of the things that she recommends. Um, this has been super fun. I love talking about food. I love talking about cooking and I love talking about sustainability. So this has been an absolute delight for me. And I think my biggest takeaway is that there are ways to kind of eat more sustainably without having to kill yourself. Um, a lot of us are trying to do these things. And so I think just putting a little bit more intention into that is not a huge ask. Um, do you have any closing thoughts for the people, Katie? I think the big thing is to just look at everything with an open mind and always before purchasing or before throwing away, ask yourself, is this the best I can do right now? Um, because typically there's, there's a better option. It's just we're in, um, we want convenience. So just keeping that in mind. Great, great closing thought. Thank you so much for all of your insights today. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of people will use all of this next week or the week after whenever this goes out uh, for their Thanksgivings. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of hearing what people do. It should be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. All right. Thanks, Katie. And thanks, everyone who's watching. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Rip it, rip it, rip it, rip it.